as all of you can see, the title of my sermon is Parting Words. <laughs> you must be wondering what is this Parting Words. <laughs> and I was listening to uh, Our Daily Bread uh, Ministries and one of the episodes in that uh, really attracted me was this sentence where the title Parting Words. And, and it really made me think, how is it that God is inspiring us with these parting words? And I was looking back at uh, different things, different parting words that people have been saying on the net and I was surprised. And there are so many ways people tell things that uh, help the individuals to change from what they are by these words. As we look back into our own lives, we also remember that we would have been addressed by people about these words. Parting is especially, uh, when I talk about parting words, it's of two kinds. One where death parts us and one where friends leave each other or families part each other and they don't intend to see each other for a very long time. And this is where certain quotes, certain words have been recorded so that we will gain from them. I recall talking to my colleague in office and trying to discuss about this and he said, before my father could die, or two weeks back, he was telling me all that what has to be done to me and how I should behave and how I should take. Well, he was the youngest in the family and he had a job. He had two sisters and a brother and he was telling, why is my father telling all this to me? He didn't realize it that his father was about to die and he was preparing the younger son to be more brave. And after two weeks, the person died and then he remembered. And still now also he's of good age and he remembers that these were the words that my father told to take care of my own family and my brothers and siblings. And he did so. And how those words changed him to be a more responsible person? And I was discussing with my wife and talking to her. She also told me that before her father could die, she remembers tell, telling her that there are angels coming to take me. And you know, that still doesn't fade away from the memory, but you know, it's still there in her mind that what, what uh, her father addressed her. Looking at these, and if you are going around the, onto the net and see what's happening, we could see a lot of people with their various expressions talking about these parting words. For example, let's look at some of the parting words that some famous people have said. Thomas Alva Edison, I guess. He said, it's very beautiful out there. I, I wonder just before his death, what did he see, you know, the beauty of the heaven, or what he has been through. He said, it's very beautiful out there. And Bob Marley, Bob Marley, the famous singer, uh, who had earned a lot by his songs and all in the reggae world, he said, money can't buy life. Winston Churchill, the great administrator, who had seen Britain through all the difficult times, through war and to prosperity, and when on his deathbed, when he is helpless on his deathbed and, you know, I am bored with it all, he said. I don't, I am not able to do anything, I am bored with it all. And there was a person remembering her grandfather, who died on October 14th, I guess, 2016. She wrote, all I could hear my grandfather says, the horses are ready. I wonder what they are thinking when they are 
passing away or you know, maybe God is showing them something. The horses are ready to take me to heaven. So these, these are certain phrases that people utter, have uttered. And one more, Jane, I guess, who said, when her uncle died, stop the world, it's my time to get off. Just imagine, uh, the world is spinning and you have seen so much in your life and you come to realize that you have to get out of this world and go to a different place where God is calling you or prepare a place for us. Stop the world, it's my time to get off. Shakespeare, in the famous mm, novel that he wrote, Julia, uh, Romeo and Juliet, he said, between two friends or two people who like each other, parting is such sweet sorrow that I shall say good night till, it's, till it be morrow. So these are some of the parting words that have been there by some, said by some famous people that help us to think back into our own very lives to realize that there are some words that the elders out of their experiences have told us of how we should live our lives. These words sometimes can be of no use to some people, but to some people it can be like a commandment that will help them change their way of thinking and be more responsible. Mahatma Gandhi, in his autobiography, which he named it as the story of my experiments with truth, Mahatma Gandhi said, I ask him, him, him is the reader, to join with me in prayer to the God of truth, that he may grant me a boon of ahimsa in mind, word and deed. When Mahatma Gandhi wanted to part ways with the reader in that novel, he quoted this. To join with me to the God of truth, that he may grant me a boon of ahimsa in mind, word and deed. And if you can further read on down to the second point there, Martin Luther King Jr. said, Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive hate, only love can do that. Quoted by Martin Luther Jr. King. And when people and family are separated for a long time, only in the agony of parting do we look into the depths of love. Only when people part from each other do we realize how much the other person loves me or how much I love the other person. Uh, off late my daughter's far away from me and she's <laughs> off in USA and she's talking to my wife often and you know, and she had a dream that I was in a dream, my mom was in a dream and all. And my wife is telling my daughter, you know, looks like you're missing your dad very much. <laughs> and that was nice. But when people part, we know what kind of love that we have for them and the depth of love that we have, as George Eliot quoted, you know, the agony of parting do we look into the depths of love? Similarly, there is one person whose name is John M. Perkins. John M. Perkins was a Christian minister, lived between 1932 to 2016, and he was advocating racial reconciliation in the US so that people accept each other. And in his last few years of his life, when he died at the age of 93, he said, repentance is the only way back to God. Brethren, all of us have to part from our loved ones at one point or the other, at one time or the other. 
But here John M. Parkins who recognized that repentance is the only way back to God. And how true! Jesus Christ, it reflects the word that Jesus Christ said, unless you repent, you will all perish. So brethren, if you look into the Bible with all these words, Luke chapter 13 verse 3 says, unless you repent, you too will perish. And how true it is, why God is asking us to repent, why the apostles are asking us to repent. Why is it, why is it that there is so much, of, so much of emphasis on repentance? Even Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 3, 19 says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be forgiven. They are focusing on the term of repentance here. Many people who have instructed the children in their lives, who have advised the children or friends and family when they depart or when they are separated, always tell them what has to be done. Because of the experiences, the difficulties, the trauma, the pain that they go through in their lives. God didn't want us as human beings to go through the same pain that He went through. He wanted that each one of us should be in His kingdom, be with Him, enjoy life to the full with Him. And all through the Bible, if you can read through, you are beginning to understand that God is asking the believer to repent and to draw closer back to Him. What can parting words help us to understand? That God is concerned for us. He loves each one of us so dearly that He doesn't want anybody, else, anybody to be condemned or destroyed. But He wants all of us to be saved. And as people who believe in God, why it's important, why is it so vital to turn from sin and to ask Christ for forgiveness? Is it important to repent in our lives? We might say, that Jesus Christ paid it all. Why is it that I need repentance still? Is it vital at this point of time to repent when we understand that Jesus Christ has paid it all for us? What does it mean for us to follow God with all our heart? These are some of the questions that that we can look into and ponder upon when we look back into our own lives and understand why we have to heed to the warnings, the cautions, the advices that people have given us, advised us, cautioned us so that, you know, we understand why they are doing it. See, sin is a transgression of God's law. Sin is such a thing that it corrupts us, it destroys us, it separates us from God. Whatever evil the human being does is sin. Murder, stealing, hate, greedy, jealousy, covetous name, you name a few things. These are all against the perfect nature of God. These unholy acts miss the mark of God's perfection 
and that sin. And sin, once it comes into our lives, it sticks to us like a virus. It keeps multiplying itself in such a manner where the growth of doing good is small when compared to the growth of sin in our lives. And sin encompasses in such a way that we tend to become slaves to it and we become disobedient to God. Just like a person who is addicted to alcohol doesn't get a high by the first drink, tries another one, tries another one till he gets a high. It, it encompasses into doing more and more of sin. And in turn, we become disobedient to God. It enslaves us in such a way that we become slaves to it. Without that we cannot do things. And Satan is so good at this. It's just like a fisherman throwing a net in the water to catch some fish and he threw the net. And today's world you have so many things to be caught into this worm of world of sin. He has put the cell phone into our hands. There are very good things in it and bad things in it. But most of the time we dwell on those things which don't honor God. It's one of the trap, he's put that net, he put it in such a way where the, the, the holes in the net are very tiny, so that even the tiniest fish or tiniest thought doesn't miss the net and he's catching us and filtering us. He's taken us like a virus that gets into our body and you know, and multiplies so fast that the whole body gets infected. And the doctors who know about these viruses, know how fast they can grow in our body and cause us to fall sick. Sin multiplies again and again and again and again and ultimately we become disobedient to God and it enslaves and makes us slaves to sin. In John chapter 3 verse 31 to 41, Whoever commits sin becomes a slave to sin. This is what John is saying. Sin becomes so much in our lives that, you know, it's very difficult for us to come out of its process unless there is an intervention from God to help us out. It is very difficult for us to come out of the snare of the devil. All those IT professionals who know, who are here, most of them who are using the computers know what a computer virus is. It slowly creeps into the system through some means or the other and slowly starts to corrupt the files that are important to us. And one day it comes to a point where a computer shuts down and doesn't turn on. By the time you could realize the entire system is down. Sin is likewise in ourselves. If we don't check that on the first instance, it keeps entering one part and the other. Ultimately, it corrupts our mind to be disobedient to God. It makes a slave to sin. And we are forced to come under the rule of Satan and do what Satan wants us to do. And, and in sin, there is no hope, there is only death and destruction. All of us do recognize how sin can damage all of us in our lives. And that is why, brethren, the call for repentance is so vivid in the Bible that all the authors ask the humans, those who believe in Jesus Christ to turn from sin because it separates us from the very nature, very love of God, cause us to disobey, disobey God, causes us to be slaves to sin and there is no hope and no salvation in God. 
at the same time let's look at what repentance can do to us in our lives. The word repentance has two meanings, uh, one a small meaning and the other one a, a bigger meaning. The simple meaning of repentance is change of mind. And the larger meaning is, there's a Greek word that is used, metonia. Meta means to take a change, to turn and newest means involving the mind, intellect, will, frame and thinking. To be simple, repentance is a change of mind but when these two words come together as repentance, it makes a lot of sense. It's not just a, a word where we say, yes, I am sorry God for what I have done but I go back and do the things that what sin has been doing. Being emotionally remorseful, being sorrow without a change in our behavior and attitude is not true repentance. Repentance brings about an about change that thinks intellectually and takes a willful decision in our lives to change from what is wrong and to do what is right as God intended us to do. In Romans chapter 2 verse 4, it reads, Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. When we as Christians feel that we have done something wrong and get the thought of repenting of what we have done wrong, we should be glad that God has been working in us. His goodness has been working in us because the goodness of God led us to repentance. I was surprised to read this verse. It is the goodness of God that is in my life that has led me to repentance. I thought to myself so long that repentance is something which I do. No, I realized that it is God who has a plan for you and in His goodness he has given you the opportunity to repent. So, when we repent, it should not be just superficial, it should be one which involves the heart, one which involves a change, one which is really sorry for what we have done, so that our lives change in such a way that we repent and go back to God sincerely and this repentance should be a response for God helping us to understand that we have done wrong. And God is helping us to have a relationship with God, with Him. We repent to be forgiven. So First John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Repent, Acts chapter 2 verse 38 says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of Holy Spirit. We repent because God is good, God is working in our lives, God has offered forgiveness to us through Jesus Christ so that we come back to Him. And when we confess to our God, He is faithful to forgive all our sins and start afresh with us. Repentance should be a response 
from our heart for what God has done in our lives and God is faithful to forgive all our sins we want to repent because we want to have a relationship with God God has promised his holy spirit to be given to us if we repent and come back to him. God doesn't want intend any one of us to perish, but he wants each one of us to have a life that is full in him. Each and every person is very precious to God. He doesn't want anybody to be left out in his kingdom. He wants each and every one of us So he is giving us an opportunity as children of God to repent, to draw back, to come closer to Him, and establish a relationship with Him. And when we repent, it should not just be superficial to the outward appearance, but it should be one with which manifest with the fruit of repentance. it should not just be up to the mouth you know it should manifest the way we behave the way we change our lives the way we interact maybe i am a person who is very angry and if i understand that i have a heart of anger and understand that god is asking me to repent i should not say that i will not be angry but at the same time go back and be angry with others but that repentance should be in a process where it should manifest the fruit that will help me change the way i look at people the way i answer people the way i talk to people without anger for example it should manifest within us the way we conduct ourselves according to what god has written in the bible it has to help us to manifest the fruit that god has asked us so that we will change from within for good and be a person that god is wanting us to be each one of us is very important to god he doesn't want any one of us to be left out you are a treasured position as we read and we know in the bible where it says god knows us even before we are born before the earth was created you are known to god and how fragile and how wonderfully and beautifully you are made but we have this nature the humanness in us where we sin and are separated from god and god is giving us an opportunity back again to draw back draw us back to him to the way of repentance and through jesus christ in deuteronomy 14:2 he says out of all the people on the earth on the face of the earth the lord has chosen you to be his treasured position a treasured position which means each and every person that has lived on this earth is valued by god he doesn't want anybody to be lost he wants each and every person to be saved to enjoy his fellowship enjoy his goodness enjoy a rich and abundant life with him but are we willing to participate in this opportunity that god has given to us let's introspect ourselves brethren and see how god is leading us to understand that god is calling us for the time that we have on this earth is very short and in the short time we should begin to understand that god is willing to work with us in our own very situation in our own way so that we are with him he helps us cope our difficulties and draw closer to him 
you and I know how powerful our God is. He made the heavens and the earth just by the word. Before the flood, just by a word, the earth was completely destroyed. And after that, the human race again came. And don't underestimate the power of God. If He wants to, He can just, by a word, completely change the entire world. But He is giving us an opportunity so that we who trust in God, draw closer to Him and change our ways so that God can work through us and make us into individuals that He wants us to. In closing, brethren, 2 Peter 3.9 says, For your sake, that is for our sake, God is patient. He does not want anyone to be destroyed but wants everyone to repent. God is patient with each one of us. He is willing to work with each one of us in our own very circumstances and mold us, fashion us, make us into shining gems just like a worker who polishes a stone and makes it shining. Each one of you are a treasured position of God. So brethren, I urge you this morning to draw back to God, identify the areas of sin in our lives, the attitudes, the actions that are against God and recognize these shortcomings and ask God to help you respond and to repent of those and be forgiven of the sins that we have done. Just like the parting words of Samuel that has been read to us by Hasini, Samuel said to the Israelites, don't fear, don't fear, do not fear. You have done all this wickedness, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart and consider what great things He has done for you. God has done very great things in our lives. In our own lives, He has drawn us to Him and He has opened our hearts to Him. So brethren, just like Samuel's parting words, don't fear but go back to God and ask Him to lead you and guide you because He is faithful God. And just like Joshua in his parting words just before his death called all the elders of the tribe of Israel to the land of Shechem, and made a covenant and asked them, will you be following God or will you be following the idols that were there before when you were in Egypt? And all of the elders said, we will follow the Lord. And Joshua said, I and my household will serve the Lord. Let's take advice from the parting words of people and from the words of the apostles and the authors of the Bible and turn to God and ask God to help us renew ourselves back to Him and enjoy a life filled with Holy Spirit by God's grace and be, become gems and lights to Him. Thank you.